President-elect Bola Tinubu has met with Babiu Kwakonso, one of his opponents in the presidential elections, the leader of New Nigeria People's Party, NNPP. Rabiu Kokonso met in a strategic meeting in France. Kokonso, who ran on the new Nigerian People's Party platform, placed fourth in the election, winning only Kano State, a stronghold of the ruling All Progressives Congress. Both men met for hours in Paris. Meeting was reportedly brokered by Kokonso's ally, Abdul Mumin Jibrin, who was formerly in Tinubu's camp. Tinubu reportedly spoke about the need to work together and planning a government of national unity. They have both agreed to hold subsequent meetings. After the meeting, which some allies of the two political leaders believe to be privy to the discussions described as successful, Kwakonso was said to have agreed to work with Tinubu and be part of his proposed government of national unity. Well, Rufai, All right. Yeah. good morning. Good to uh, see you. Good morning, Ayo. Uh, finally, uh, things have started to align politically in the country. Uh, Kwan Koso has finally met with Tinobu. I probably think that maybe that was why Kwan Koso didn't go to court in the first place. Because the NN NNPP, it claimed, oh, they made a good showing, but their name was not on the ballot. And because of that, I mean, their logo was not fully written on the ballot. And because of that, they felt disgruntled. And people like Elijah Buba Galadima constantly came on this show and touted, oh, NNPP, NNPP, we have been left behind and all of that. Injustice as regards the elections. Kwan Kaso took complaint about the elections. The question we'll ask Mr. Kwan Kaso is that, will he now say these elections were devolved of crisis because he's met with the president-elect now? And that's what we increasingly say about politicians. It's about where the interests align for them. Even look at Mr. Jubrin. I broke out the meeting. It was formerly in the Tinubu camp. We all remember the famous interview we had with him right here when he was pushing the Tinubu agenda. But because of his own interest, because he wasn't going to get a stake to be able to run for position in the APC, obviously because of the challenges he had in Kano State, he moved on to the NMPP. So it shows that politicians is only what serves their own interest. The alignment has started, and I'm not surprised. It's politicians. I think we, we take them too much to heart. But all of this is in the quest for the president-elect's legitimacy too. And this is a strong point for him, political watchers will say, that getting this meeting under his belt with Kwon Koso, he's got a big ally in the north. Anyway, he has always had allies and alliances in the north. I think the next point of action for him will be how he can have meetings too with other strong, formidable parts. And definitely, I'm sure, he's already in the works planning those meetings and orchestrating the meeting, how he can meet with other candidates. Atikwa Waka is in court, Peter Obi is in court. I'm sure he wants to meet with those ones too, to be able to solidify a front. But will that remove the gap of the elections that were fraught with so much irregularities, like BBC showed? Or BBC stated in their write-up, as regards what happened in the rivers, is that going to take away all the challenges people had around the elections? Is that going to meet the yearnings and the aspirations of Nigerians that want a better economy, that want you to solve the problem of insecurity? Here you go again with politicians. But kudos to them. Yes. Let them have their meeting. If it's going to orchestrate the unity and the solidarity, well on them. But... Politicians should think of the interests of the people more than anything, and rather than their personal interest alignment, like they have in a meeting. So I will not, I would, I will not hold my breath too much. I am more of those meetings will come. Already the Tinubu camp has sent people to meet Body George. So they will, they will have this handshake across. All right. Dr. Vati, government or national Well, meeting? two politicians meeting. I don't see a big deal there. Politicians always meet. Um, you know, speculations about what their motives may be. Well, it's good for the purpose of analysis. We can, you know, encourage them, uh, but you never know, you know, what the outcome will be eventually. But we we'll recall that, uh, you know, Ashwa Jubala met Chinubu after the election. I'd said he was reaching out to everybody. 
and that it would, uh, part of its objective would be to unify uh, groups, interest groups, and other persons uh, who may not have supported them. And I think that that is the spirit, because given the divisions arising from the elections, from the uh, 2023 general electoral process, uh, this country needs to heal. The point we've always made is that, look, the people who were wounded in that election, the people who are aggrieved, there is need for reconciliation. Uh, you recall that the campaign process was so febrile, there was so much vitriol, and we had made a point that reconciliation is very important going forward. And we hope that, apart from uh, the uh, president-elect, other politicians involved in that uh, process will see the need you know, to reconcile so that this country can begin to heal because there are more important issues ahead. In this particular case, it's uh, Senator Kwan Kwan so, uh, reaching out uh, and here and the Tinubu uh, meeting in France. Well, they didn't meet in Nigeria here. Maybe it's better to hold political meetings in France. Maybe the weather there is uh, much yes. better, you, you know, it's cooler. Yes, yeah, so, you know, <laughs> so one of these days, Nigerian politicians will go and meet in <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> but whatever it is, you know, we like the idea of reconciliation, of uh, planning to come together. But you know, of course, that politicians don't uh, unite just like that. The question will be, what will Kwan Kwan so be offered? What will his own supporters, what will be their gain? Uh, because uh, politicians are not the most altruistic of uh, persons. So in that regard, we cannot speculate. But there was another side of the uh, conversation as reported by this day newspaper this morning, which is that the president-elect promised to ensure reconciliation between Senator Rabi Kwan Kwan So and his successor, Abdullahi Ganduje, the uh, incumbent governor of uh, Kano State, who is also very close uh, to Ashwa Jubola and Metinubu. And you know that there is no love lost between uh, the two of them. So even at a personal level, you know, if that reconciliation uh, goes through, it will also be for the uh, health, for the good health of politics in Kano State, where there is great division between the incumbent governor and the uh, Kwan Kwan Sigia group, of which he himself used to be a member before he parted ways. So politicians, you know, politics is about exits and entrances. You know, today you are friends, tomorrow uh, you are on a different side, but they are all united by the same interest, which is power, which is position. But the emphasis, even as the president-elect talks about unity, government of national unity, should not be about just power, position, privileges. It should be about what is best for Nigeria. And I assume that, uh, you know, if the uh, president-elect uh, places the proper accent on merit, on integrity, on unity, on the best and the brightest from any part of Nigeria, without reference to, oh, these people didn't vote for me. Oh, how many votes did we get from your state? The emphasis should be on getting the best hands on the deck to move this country forward. There, there is a lot to be done. Inflation, as you were discussing yesterday, is now 22.22%. Food inflation is uh, over 24%. Nigerians are suffering because they are also afraid that things could get worse. So whichever you know, best hands can be recruited to do the job, yes, the president-elect should keep an open mind in the matter. Well, I almost feel like commenting on this in, fr fr in French, seeing that a number of meetings happen in France, and France might be play a huge France role. France is, is a new London. Yes. I, I, I mean, I mean, France is the home of the investment meetings. Perhaps. And so these are the so investment talks these are that are the investment happening. talks that are so happening I almost want to France say bonjour, Nigeria, you know, just to begin. With. Let, let, let me, like, on the surface of it, it, it's, as has been already said, on the surface of it, this looks like a good presidential um, posture in terms of forming, in, in the quest to forming a government of national unity, reaching out to those who feel aggrieved. Because recall that after the announcement of Ashwa Jubala Metinubu as president-elect by INEC, uh, Alaji Kwakwanso had actually asked for the cancellation of the elections. So he was dissatisfied with the way the elections were run and the outcome of the elections. Nevertheless, 
um, Ashwaj Bola Metinwo had said that he would reach out, he would, you know, put out an olive branch and see how even his opponents can work together. Uh, Atiku, a large Atiku rebuffed his advances. Same with Mr. Peter Obi of the Labour Party, who came second and third respectfully in that, um, respectively in that election, and they've now gone to court. As Rufai already mentioned, um, Alaju Kwakonsu didn't go to court. Now they are on the negotiation table and they are speaking. Now it's important for this alliance between the APC, or perhaps in this case, the president-elect, and Alaju Kwakonsu, because Kano State, which is a stronghold of the NNPP, is quite critical to the Northwest and perhaps in terms of the numbers. And in that state, Aladji Kwakwansu has a cult-like following with the Kwakwansia movement. In fact, Kano State was the only state that he won. And out of 40 State House of Assembly seats, NNPP has 25. In the same case, APC, um, Kano State used to be an APC stronghold until, of course, the Kwakwansia movement um, took over and displayed really excellently in the last election. Therefore, it would make sense for him to reach out to Alanjo Kwakonso to see how they can work together, bearing in mind that the Northwest gave him over 30% of his victory at the polls in the last elections. Therefore, you would understand why he would want to meet. Beyond meeting with Alanjo Kwakonso, of course, has been mentioned, the meeting um, was said, was speculated, that he also tried to broker peace between Alaji, um, the governor, the um, sitting governor, Ganduje and Kwakonso, Remember that um, Governor Ganduje was the deputy governor of Alaji Kwakonso before things went awry between both of them, and now they're trying to work a peace. What I would like to ask is, around the statements with regards to the Emirates, the new Emirates that we made, the restoration of the former Emir of Kano, would this be in, on the ne negotiation table as well in terms of whether peace would be had and what would then come out of it? What speculations have said, because we haven't gotten the full report of the four-hour meeting between both of them, is that perhaps the president-elect offered Alanji Kwakonso some ministerial positions. I would want to take that with a pinch of salt because for a man of Alanji Kwakonso's caliber and pedigree, you would assume that he is possibly beyond or bigger than that position of um, a minister. But he's also gone there to speak on behalf of his party members and maybe promises would have been made as to some of his party members getting some juicy positions in the next administration. But has been said, and I must end with this, at the end of the day, what, what is before the president-elect is a nation in need of great leadership. Therefore, we are hopeful that they would not sacrifice competence on the altar of scoring political points with opponents and people that they feel loyal to. Because this has what has plagued us in the past and has brought us to where we are today. We need technocrats, we need experienced people, and not just people who need to be compensated in leadership. Moving on to the next story, the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors will commence a five-day warning strike today following the failure of the federal government to meet its demands. The doctors are starting the strike despite the fact that the federal government said it had begun talks with their parent body, the Nigerian Medical Association. As doctors cited poor health infrastructure as one of the reasons for the strike, reports observed that Nigerians spent a total of $7.07 .07 billion on overseas treatment between 2016 and 2022. The list bill for medical tourism was in 2016, about $17 million, while the highest amount was spent in 2019, $2.56 billion. Meanwhile, President Mohamed Buhari is back in Nigeria after undergoing medical treatment in the UK in the past week. Buhari left Nigeria on May 3rd to join other world leaders in London for the coronation ceremony of King Charles III. Although the trip was scheduled for five days, Buhari extended his stay by one week for dental treatment. The president is expected to chair the weekly meeting of the Federal Executive Council, which holds today. Well, welcome back, Mr. President. Mm. Ufai? Welcome back, Mr. President. Mr. President is one of the biggest medical tourists in Nigeria as we speak today. And it's obvious, this was the same man that, and I think, you know, for the sake of public integrity, they should release how much the president spent in medical tourism in his administration. Because that was at a point, it went for half of the year. It was on medical tourism abroad. And I also hear, please, that at that time, all his, all his, what is it called, things that surround him like his plane too was packed while he was getting medical treatment. So for all the expenses, 
that is spent on medical tourism. It's best we see these things. Because, you see, we live in a country that when we don't do things properly, we become a joke. This was the same Mr. President when he was campaigning in 2015. Talked a lot about the health care. But he came into power. He became the chief medical tourist. And the sad reality is that we are also having a president-elect that is constantly with investors in France. So, you see, it speaks volumes of our nation. And the kind of country we run will be the way people look at us. It is sad that today we don't even have a world-class hospital where our presidents can go. When American president falls sick, we compare ourselves with America a lot. But I don't like to compare ourselves with America because they have a lot more than us. The comparison is not good. But at least America has a place like Walter Reed. The UK, when Boris Johnson was sick or to death with COVID, he went to an NHS hospital. At least even if it's only the federal medical centers, we could make centers of excellence all over this country. We will know that our president can go there and get dental care. Not seeking various investments abroad. Truth has to be told. It saddens my heart that doctors are going to go on strike. But I think the government needs to learn how to stop the strikes. And by making the proper investments. See how much we are frittering away in, in medical tourism. Olon Nimbe Mamura, Minister of State for Science and Technology, said something that shook me to my marrow. He said over 30,000 primary health care centers, only 10% of them are functioning properly in Nigeria. Over 30,000 primary health care. So the primary health care system is shambolic as we speak. You just try to go to a primary health care center and see it. I bet most of us seated here, we have never gone to a government hospital in a while. Because there's little or nothing. And this is the reason why the governors are going, uh, doctors are going on strike. And on top of this, one lawmaker still had the temerity to say, oh, we must force the doctors to stay. I saw the interview when I was away, when people interviewed him. And they asked him, do you even know what's happening in the medical sector? He said he asked his friend about what's happening in medical before he put the bill to the National Assembly. You see how we've become like chalky child's play. So we must stop this attitude of seeking medical investments abroad. And it should begin with our leaders and try as much as possible to bolster the healthcare sector and grow the healthcare sector. We can do it. Absolutely. This country is great. Thank you. Well, the doctor's strike. 12,000 resident doctors are going on strike for the next five days, between now and May uh, 22nd. Now, they had first given uh, a two-week ultimatum. That was on April 29, which is part early this week. For two weeks, the federal government refused to talk to this body of National Association of Resident uh, Doctors. And now they are going on strike in about 79 health uh, facilities across the country. Now, resident doctors constitute the backbone of the health sector. What are their demands? They are asking for a 200% increase in what is called consolidated medical salary structure. Uh, that's commerce. They are asking for infrastructure, upgrade of infrastructure in health facilities across the country. Three, they are asking for massive recruitment of uh, clinical staff across the health sector in Nigeria. Four, they are saying that the bill, saying that uh, Nigerian doctors cannot get their license or until they have served for five years, should be withdrawn from the National Assembly. Okay, yesterday we had information that even the federal government is not in support of that particular bill. The question to ask is, these resident doctors, they've been on this matter, of these their demands, for more than six months. They have been pointedly ignored by the federal government. The argument that has been put up by uh, Dr. Chris Ngege, the Minister of uh, uh, Labor, is that, look, federal government is talking to the Nigeria Medical Association, which is the parent body for medical doctors in Nigeria, and that you know, he thinks that the strike by the resident doctors is unnecessary. But the resident doctors are saying they are not aware that the NMA, as the uh, umbrella body, is against their demands. 
And that in any case, it's not just salary that they are talking about. They are talking about conditions within the health sector generally, and that the government needs to talk to them. So we have this strike sometimes because, you know, our resident doctors are just ignored. I think it's important, even if the federal government is talking to the NMA, it's important that the federal government should have spoken to the resident doctors themselves. Their leader, uh, Dr. Emeka Oji, has granted interviews in which he says, you know, ignoring them will not serve any purpose. Now, if 12,000 doctors go on strike for the next five days, the implications for healthcare provision in the country is better imagined. Mm -hmm. Now, on top of this, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, medical tourism. And according to a report, a detailed report in the Punch newspaper uh, today, over seven uh, uh, million dollars, over seven billion dollars has been spent over a period of about six years on medical tourism alone. Now, two years ago, there was a bill before the uh, House of uh, Reps by uh, Segios Ogun, mm -hmm. PDP, Edo State, proposing in that bill, section 46 thereof, that look, public officials, except it's an emergency, should not use public funds to go on any form of medical tourism, to discourage medical tourism in Nigeria. That bill just managed to go past the second reading, nothing happened. At the end of the day, the process was abandoned, which means that there is no political will on the part of our leaders to even address this medical tourism. Part of the objective of that bill, as proposed, was to develop the health sector to such a level as we had in the 70s, when people used to come from Saudi Arabia to seek medical care Arizona, in yes. Nigeria. Yes, the Saudi royal family. People yes. used to come here, uh, UCH Chibadon, yes. to, for medical treatment. But these days, nobody wants to come here. Because uh, as the irony, as the paradox that we face, as uh, shown, President Muhammad Buhari started uh, uh, his uh, presidency when he first went to the UK to treat ear infection. <laughs> He's now ending uh, uh, his tenure. Also, again, on the note of uh, medical tourism, Jeez. this time around, it is a toothache with all the uh, dentists that we have in Nigeria. But in any case, the standard uh, explanation that has been offered by Garuba Shewu and Femi Additional is that uh, the president, being an elder statesman, has been using a particular set of doctors for years. And that, you know, it's better that he goes to see his personal doctors. That's a strong argument that has been offered uh, in that uh, regard. But we would like to see a situation whereby medical facilities in Nigeria are better developed, whereby the infrastructure that the resident doctors are asking for uh, is treated as a priority, and that our doctors are well treated. The argument that anybody that wants to leave Nigeria as a medical doctor is not uh, a fair argument. And that's why I think that the resident doctors should be listened to, because they have even issued a threat that if they are not, their demands are not addressed by May 29, they will welcome the incoming administration with another round of prolonged strike. It's quite unfortunate and sad what's going on in the health sector in Nigeria, especially because it seems as if their agitations are not even well managed by the Ministry of Labor and Employment. The Minister of Labor and Employment, uh, Dr. Chris Ngege, has made some statements in the past that could have been said to be insensitive to the plight of the doctors in Nigeria. And so you can imagine in other parts of the world, Nigeria is not the only country where health workers are asking for an increase in pay. The UK, we've talked about a number of times, has experienced the mother of all strikes in recent times because workers across different sectors, including the health sectors and resident doctors, have been on strike. However, you would hear the kind of conversations that are being had the negotiations, the um, prime minister coming to speak about it, the secretary of health coming to speak about it, and speaking with respect and also understanding and empathy, even though being very firm that they would not be able to meet the demands of the workers because of prevailing economic situations. What we have in Nigeria instead is, you can go, we have more doctors. If you go on strike, you will not get paid. It is against the law. So there's this strong, even in terms of diplomacy, it then demonstrates to you perhaps how doctors are regarded in this nation. Take example, the salaries of doctors. Like, as we mentioned, they are asking for a 100% pay increase, 200% pay increase. 
And the Minister of Labour and Employment has said emphatically that it is not feasible. And you can understand, we've talked about it a number of times, that Nigeria is, I mean, the country is broke, we need to show up revenue. And so, in terms of increasing their pay, it might be yeah, almost an impossible task at this moment. But, when you speak about that, then you then put their salaries and their allowances side by side, the salaries and allowances of our reps, um, House of Reps members. And then you see the discrepancy or perhaps the importance that is attached to this critical um, sector in the nation. And so it is difficult for a doctor, a resident doctor, to appreciate or understand that his salary, which is around 300000 350000 cannot be reviewed when his, well, he, the staff member in the House of Representatives who goes on recess a number of times in the cycle of their tenure gets a lot, almost a thousand percent more than what they're earning in allowances and in, and in salaries. You can see where it doesn't make sense. And when they tell them there's no money, they're asking them, but look at how fat the House of Reps or the National Assembly is and their take-home pay is. And doctors who, who are spending their lives, who are, um, work in very hazardous conditions, are not given the same treatment. It boggles the mind. And so... He's asked them to come to the negotiation table, but we must also consider the lives and welfare of this very important sector of society. And I had to put that side by side with the education sector because that is also coming up as well very soon. We mustn't, you know, we're talking about medical tourism, but we need to also spotlight education tourism in Nigeria. How much money we're investing in countries like the UK, in the US, even in Sudan, as we found out recently, through education tourism, where our people would go to universities, both Nigerian universities, so that they, they are guaranteed the number of time they'll stay in, in school. Critical um, parts of our society, we cannot let them to go to rot.